Hi everyone, I'm Wendy Muse, creator of the Left Pocket Project, which brings you the history of leftists of color one swipe at a time. And this is the Left Pocket Project podcast. Today's episode is an installment of our special series, Reading Revolution, where we read and discuss work written by or that inspired leftists of color. We'll be discussing the text quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong, also known as the Little Red Book. Before I get into the background on Mao and the book itself, I just wanted to remind everyone that they can find a full copy of the book for free on our Patreon page by visiting patreon.com slash leftpoc. You can also visit our Patreon to make a donation of a dollar or more per month to help us keep all of our content 100% free. Also be sure to check us out on social media by searching for Left POC and to rate and review us on iTunes. Now on to Mao and the Little Red Book. Because Mao did so much in his lifetime, I'm going to give little bits of his biography and political influence with each episode of this three-part series. First, his early years. Mao Zedong was born in 1893 in Hunan province in central China to farming parents. Throughout his childhood and teenage years, the young Mao became interested in different religious and political philosophies, picking up and studying, then losing interest in everything from Buddhism and Confucianism to Republicanism, Liberalism, and Socialism. He was briefly part of a civilian rebel army during the 1911 revolution that sought to overthrow imperial rule and establish China as a republic. After only six months in the rebel forces, Mao worked across a wide variety of fields, later resuming his studies at Teachers College, where he continued to engage his political interests with communist friends and professors. In 1917, he moved to Beijing, where he assisted the university librarian who would go on to found the Communist Party of China only a few years later. His rural background and humble upbringing, in addition to his having to work a series of low-level jobs to survive without family support, greatly shaped his experiences. In 1919, he moved to Shanghai, where a backdrop led by a variety of leftist factions, including the student group that he had started, engaged in a series of political protests and social unrest. At this time, Mao also became as voracious a writer as he was a reader. His writing skills come through the many excerpts of his speeches found in quotations of Mao Zedong, or what is popularly referred to as the Little Red Book, because of how it was bound and circulated around the world. The Little Red Book was initially published by the daily newspaper of the Chinese People's Liberation Army in 1964 with 267 quotations, but later expanded to include 427 of Mao's quotations. Within only a few years, the book had been revised, translated, and circulated to 117 countries. For this episode, we'll begin with the first half, 156 pages of the book, which is broken into 33 different topic chapters. Be sure to check back for parts two and three for a continuation to the second half of the book, more on Mao's life, and the historical impact of the Little Red Book. Now on with the show. So, hi, Richard. How's it going? Hello, and uh, it's going good. Uh, Things, I've had some positive things going on in general, so I'm I'm in a generally good mood, optimistic. That's good. (laughs) That makes one of us. Um, No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, it's also almost the end of the year. I mean, it's like we have a few more weeks left of 2019, which has been an interesting year, uh, to say the least. So yeah, I, I'm looking forward to, I don't know. I'm looking forward to the new year. I'm also looking forward to, I I, I think I can look back at this year and say that what we did was kind of fun. Um, we read some interesting stuff, talked to some interesting people. Um, and even though, We had the November hiatus uh, because of stuff that was going on with me. It was, you know, nice to be back, for example. Um, But I would definitely say that there are certain parts of this year that I'm I'm ready to be done with. Um, We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Because it's not, unfortunately, the years don't like finalize themselves and then get rid of all the bad stuff. The bad stuff just continues, right, um, into the next year. But I've had that imaginary thought that oh when we start a new year it's like turning a new leaf or turning over a new leaf turning a new page but um new year new me right except that the country and the things that it does don't do that um so (laughs) Mm -hmm. maybe the best way to look at it is new year new methods of fighting the system that oppresses us 
um, and others. Yeah, no, it's a, uh, it, with the year end, it does, uh, I think, encourage us all to do a bit of retrospect of the year that's passed. And uh, as you mentioned, it's been a very interesting and informative year that we've had uh, being able to speak with various people and the readings that we've been able to do both uh, here and then just independently as well. And uh, experiences that uh, we've had as a result of, you know, looking and engaging in this both the material and the, the just the I know you do a lot of conferences or and and attend those as well and there's been various other aspects and it's all been great and I'm just very thankful for everybody that's uh, been a part of it with us and with listening and sharing and liking and all those types of things and the messages and feedback that they give as well on Twitter and, and so forth that's been a wonderful experience for me and so I look forward to having a uh, at some point uh a more engaged and in-depth retrospect at that. Yeah, absolutely. We will be doing that um, before the year is out, by the way, for listeners who are listening right now. Um, the other thing I should add to is just, again, I always have these disclaimers, but uh, there's construction going on literally right next door to my house. Um, so there's going to be some hammering and noise and things dropping. Um, however, if you'd like to contribute to getting me a private studio, you can always go to patreon.com slash <laughs> left POC and stop, drop a $500 donation um, so that both Richard and I can have uh, separate personal home studios uh, to do the recording in any day now. Um, <laughs> no, but on that note, I do actually want to give a really big shout out and special thank you to the patrons who held on during November because we mm -hmm. had an uptick this year, like towards, sort of towards the middle of the year with patrons, which of course we are incredibly appreciative of and thank you so much um, because you helped fuel this podcast quite literally with your um, donations, but also um, the fact that like we were gone for a month and you guys held on and continue to contribute. Um, so that really makes a huge difference for us. Um, and again, like right now, um, I've, I've released repeated times, um, the list of kind of where your funding goes, how we use your money. If you ever have questions, like a dish, you want to see, I don't know, um, more detailed explanations or enumerations of, of the funding, please feel free to ask. Um, but I have put out a post on Patreon that sometimes I re up here and there and repost just about where your money goes. Um, and we depend on it for funding storage, um, for paying for things like a microphone, um, for helping pay, uh, the people who do our transcripts. And right now our one, we had one assistant who had to unfortunately resign, but for good reason, she got a fellowship, which is great. Um, but our other assistant who's still hanging on there, I mean, she does so much work and she deserves every penny she gets, if not more, if I could pay her more, I would. Um, so we just want to make sure that everyone who adds to this project is being properly compensated. Um, and also just, as I said, to pay for like web stuff, unfortunately, web storage is still expensive. Um, and to podcasts and things like that, you have to have storage and whatnot. But again, if you want to ever see the list, it's on, um, Patreon. And if you have, questions about the list, you want to see more details, I'd be more than happy to just give you that as well. So again, thanks to everyone who's um, been able to donate a dollar or more to this project and to help us continue into the new year. So thank you. Um, yes, thank you. Very, thank you all. Definitely very much. And it's not just, uh, it doesn't just help us as well, you know, help other projects. And then not to mention that uh, it helps for those who can't contribute. It it helps maintain and keep the, the everything going so that they continue, that we can continue to produce content for those that are unable and can only, you know, share or drop a like every now and then. And so uh, we appreciate everybody and all the things that everyone does. And I'm sure those people also appreciate being able to get uh, access to the content because everything is uh, free access for anybody uh, right. as a result of those that are able to contribute. And so I uh, definitely much appreciation to all of you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so today we're talking about the little red book as it's commonly referred to. Um, you know, as I mentioned in the <laughs> intro, that's not the actual title of the book. And the, the book is actually a compilation of quotations from multiple speeches and events and things like that, that uh, Chairman Mao did. Um, throughout a course of, I believe, looks like two or three decades that are covered in, by this book. Uh, but 
did is we actually went through and we've broken it into like the, the book itself is broken into parts, at least the English version. I'm not sure what the original version is like, um, but it's broken into chapters that are based on categories. And then all of the quotations that are related to that category fall in that particular chapter. So the whole thing is a book of quotations, which I was I actually didn't realize. Um, I don't know about you and you can feel free to like add your comments on this. But when I first started reading it, I was like, oh, wait a second. Like it's all quotations. That's going to be kind of hard to read and enjoy. But at the same time, I was thinking like, well, what might have worked and maybe one way that people read it was like you just pick it up and you, you flip to a page and you read that quotation and like think about what it means um, and how to apply it. So I could also see how something like that um, would be beneficial, but definitely reading it was a little bit different from, or very different actually from all the other readings that we've had that have been more like, you know, prose or essays or something like that, that makes it a little bit more fluid. Uh, but I don't know. What did you think just as a first, re first reaction or um, first impressions of format and things like that? Yeah, uh, I had a lot of the same things going on as, as you did as like, uh, I wasn't too familiar with the text itself uh, going into this. And I we had, I've heard of Mao in, in the research that we've been doing and some of the history behind what was going on there and also some of the propaganda from Western capitalistic sources as well. And so like, I it was in place that I was interested in, in engaging. And so this is a very popular text. So it seemed like a fitting place to, uh, to jump in and was surprised to kind of see the format of it. Uh, as far as uh, my perception of the format, besides that uh, it, I kind of like the more digestible bits as mm -hmm. far as like initially, like that was like, uh, it, it appealed to me, you know, that I wasn't going to be, in, it wasn't going to be presented in more of like a philosophical kind of presentation, but more, I guess, kind of sermony, like mm -hmm. in that, you know, highlighting some specific uh, quotes from longer uh, speeches to, to tell stories or something. And then that's kind of also how I imagined I would process it uh, from a more personal perspective rather than, you know, from the analytical show perspective would be, you know, take a quote flip or you know flip open the book look at a quote and just kind of think about what that meant and how, what I thought about it and then that whether I fully agreed or whatever with the quote but rather than take it as you know like gospel or anything like that I would look at it as you know a jumping off point for a more detailed investigation into a theme that's worth investigating right I think to one thing that you mentioned um that I think I definitely want to touch on uh, you talked briefly about the like how it was interesting for you to read it sort of outside the boundaries of Western capitalist representations of Mao and of his words. Um, I had a similar experience just because I've not had any, I've had like literally zero exposure to this. Um, and to be honest, in the U.S. education system and this just by virtue of like what I personally study, I haven't engaged a ton with. Uh, the revolution in China um, and some of the things that happened there and Maoism as a whole. I think most of my um, interpretation or understanding of the left and communism, socialism, these sorts of things is heavily influenced by European models um, or models that I see sort of reverberating throughout South America and Africa, again, just by virtue of my research. Um, so it was really interesting to read something from that time period and from this this group, you know, just kind of thinking about Mao and the people that followed him um, and that followed his philosophies and teachings. Um, but also, I think just with China constantly in the news now, right? Like you cannot mm -hmm. open a newspaper or do people even read and people don't read physical newspapers anymore, but you can't <laughs> go to the website of the New York Times or the Guardian or any anywhere basically without seeing at least one or two articles about what's going on um, in China, whether it's about Chinese um, investments in other countries, or if it's about the controversy over the Uyghurs, um, or, you know, just like sometimes even just business sector um, situations that are happening in, in terms of companies expanding and stuff like that. There's always something about China being said, and China has sort of been erected as this um, uh, sort of boogeyman again in the ways that I think we often have done to Russia and the USSR prior to that. Um, so it's interesting to kind of think about, kind of think through this, this discussion of what 
the foundation of sort of Chinese communist thought and ideas, what was happening at that time. Um, and I think also for me, I'm just speaking for myself here, but I think it's useful to read because we can get, I, I think it's important to read a lot of different people, right? I should say that, you know, regardless mm -hmm. of if you agree with them hundred percent or if you agree with the way they implemented their ideas, because that's always a controversy too. Like there's a discussion about, you know, certain figures in, in the past of communism and how they went about um, implementing communism and in, in socialism in their countries and whether or not, uh, oftentimes the success model is sort of based on, you know, how many people they killed or something. And it doesn't necessarily reflect on what the starting point was. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think it's important for us to look at those starting points and also to constantly reflect on, because uh, some of the things that he brings up in this, I, especially with regard to the way foreign imperialism works, is that it kind of makes us stop and think like, how do these movements also then spiral and get into a place where maybe we're looking at it and we're saying, oh, I don't agree with that tactic or, oh, this is not the best approach to take. Um, because he does, he does have warnings throughout, like, you know, sometimes, um, that make us reflect on like what imperialism does to a country and does to a leader as well and does to a people and how it can also change the direction and mission that they set upon initially um, in terms of trying to create a kind of more functional and fair and it, albeit arguably utopian society, right? Um, so like for me, I just personally speaking, I'm not, I, I have, I have criticisms of a lot of places. I don't go onto Twitter and air those, those grievances. Um, cause it's not that important. I speak mainly almost exclusively about what the U S does because that's where my tax dollars go. Um, and that's the country that I live in and that I'm a citizen of. But I also think that there are, um, you know, certain, certain things that I, that I can look at and say, Oh, I don't like the direction that's going, or I don't think that's necessarily adherent to the fundamental principles that that country or that group or whatever has upheld. But I also think that this is why it's so important to look at the source and to read it as a historical object and also to read it as sort of just like a foundational text that we can learn from, like seeing it more objectively, I guess I'm trying to say. And so not having just this constant weight, as you mentioned, of Western imperialists framing of these ideas on top of everything we read and discuss yeah it is it is a burden that's born i believe and when engaging in texts like this and so to be able to try to like i feel like the last year has helped prepare for me to be able to engage this and give it an honest engagement that i wouldn't have been able to several years back mm -hmm. like and so i do remember i believe uh mal came up ever so briefly uh, in some of the very first texts that we looked at, but that weren't, it wasn't like a particular uh, book, but uh, selections from a variety included Lenin, Stalin, or not Stalin, but excuse me, uh, okay. but yeah, but Lenin and uh, Marx and a variety of other people. And so like, uh, and Mao was in there and I believe it was around the mass line, which mm -hmm. I also found in here uh, where I think that, uh, Mao was especially uh, where it, it wrong, especially poignant for me. Uh, and then uh, I did. I, I agree with all the things that you said, and so it's it's also uh, very important, I guess, for me personally engaging with the stuff to to try to separate myself from some of that because it, it's so pervasive and so ingrained that like it makes it really hard to engage with these ideas sometimes if you let that overwhelm and I felt like this text in particular the quotations selected and then later we did a kind of a companion text as well that gave me insight into what I was reading that allowed me to really uh, appreciate it for what it was uh, historically and philosophically beyond what it was uh, kind of in the propaganda sense that it, I think it would have been a lot easier for me to receive it years ago before I had gone through what we've been working on here and elsewhere. And so I, I, I just, I think it's good that if, if people are, you know, heard we're talking about Mao and they're still listening, I think that's good. Even if they're <laughs> a little uneasy and uncomfortable about engaging with it uh, at, in the first place. Right. Like, don't be, don't be scared. <laughs> it's got yeah. some good stuff in it um, as chairman fred said if you're scared of socialism scared of yourself so. <laughs> sorry can you repeat that i'm sorry i was laughing thinking about oh, it. Now if you're afraid of communism you're afraid of yourself you know <laughs> yeah 
yeah, I think I think engaging this text and other texts is it's important. It's an important act as someone who is like speaking as anyone um, who's interested in left ideology. Um, you got to understand the past before you move forward and to understand the ways that the past continues to frame the present and past thought can, instead of like, re- you know, I always say this, I say this like practically every episode, but instead of always focusing on reinventing the wheel, think about the things that you can take from, from things that people have said and thought and written before and how they can be applied to the present, how they can be shifted and changed to apply to the present, et cetera. But you have to have a basis somewhere. Um, and it's something we talked about, obviously, when we read Freire as well, quite a bit, um, you know, on this idea of understanding both praxis and and the theory behind it. Um, so I think this is an important place for us to kind of get a handle on on this theory and whether or not it was applied as intended is not so relevant, not as relevant as much as it is like interpreting it as a text that we can learn from. And um, I think one of the things, one of the themes that I've seen from a lot of the texts that we've read is that most of these people that are contributing this, inf- these ideas would much rather uh, folks be engaging with the ideas and trying it and getting it wrong and like, but, tr- and learning from their mistakes rather than spend a lifetime mastering the the theory itself you know mm-hmm. it's like they it's they none of them would say that you can do either or but always both and uh like doing only one is a is an injustice to the other and so right. i don't and want he, it I to come off as like elitist or you you have to have be able to write a thesis on any of these texts <laughs> or anything in order to be able to engage with them and, and bring them into your uh practical application Right. And I think, I mean, what's cool is that Mao himself even addresses this um, as he gets into later chapters. He has some sections where he talks about, you know, the need for people to constantly be in touch with people, right? Like if you're a leader, you need to constantly have an idea of what's going on with your people, check in with them, change things, shift stuff as needed, you know, but have have a basic set of principles, of course, um, but to also be sure that you're always attentive to the needs of the, the people, the masses. Um, and so I think that's kind of a, an interesting way to apply his words to a text that we're reading in hopes of doing that. Um, but I just wanted to give a little bit of basic info on this episode. So Richard and I read the first half of the book um, to around 156, um, which would be the end of the 14th chapter, uh, which is called Relations Between the Army and the People. Um, So just so you know what we're dealing with for this episode, and then the next episode, we're going to continue with the second half of the book. And then in the third episode, we're going to talk about um, some texts that contextualize the book as it relates to other revolutionary groups or um, thinkers and um, kind of kind of think about the history of the book, not only as a not only as the book itself was being created, but also as a text that inspired um, many people and kind of made them think differently uh, about their own approaches to left left thinking. Um, So the first thing I just wanted to touch on is that Obviously, I mean, it's pretty clear from the jump um, that this book is written on the basis of Mao's thought and that that's defined as Marxist-Leninist. Um, and it's a Marxist-Leninism that is particularly focused on um, in defeating imperialism um, and to into sort of implementing a socialist understanding and, and practices of, um, or socialist practices, excuse me, for China. The other thing to keep in mind is that obviously China is a huge country um, with a very diverse population. And so part of it also is focused, the book itself is focused on how to unify these very varied factor, excuse me, factions um, within the country, while at the same time prioritizing those who are at this time um, that he's discussing this, primarily peasants, farm workers. Um, but he does he does spend a lot of time as well throughout talking about how to re-educate the bourgeoisie, the middle class, and to make them part of this fight, which I think is really important too, because sometimes we have these discussions as well, like how do we make sure that we're not like... <laughs> I guess, seeding ground to our class enemy by making them the leaders, right? Um, and so I think that his his focus on constantly educating and constantly being in touch with all different types of groups is important throughout. Um, it's something that's sort of woven throughout the text and that we get a very clear understanding of from the jump of the book. 
Um, so yeah, so anyway, those are my first like introductory points. Um, I'm not sure where you wanted to start specifically. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Why don't we start with like a first quote, a first quotation that stood out to you, um, that you wanted to talk about. If you could just tell us the page number, if you're using the version that we posted in the, on the Patreon page, which is free for everyone, that's the one that we're focusing on now, just so you know what, where the pages are. Uh, just a, a quick note on which you mentioned about hi historically the kind of context of this. Uh, one of the things that I think is lost in a lot of Western uh, descriptions of the history of China is uh, just in 1990, the Chinese economy was a tiny fraction of the U.S.'s economy, uh, like much less than 10 percent the size, whereas now it's almost 60 percent. It's almost uh, basically 60 percent of the U.S. economy. So uh, this was uh like the time period that this was transpiring and that, that followed was a, uh, a large economic boom. And then during Mao's time in particular was a redistribution of the existing wealth from uh, kind of a, uh, in, uh, I don't a more Royal history towards uh, the peasantry. And so like that colors a lot of the rhetoric, sp the specific rhetoric in there. The quote that caught my attention in particular uh, was kind of right off the, right in the beginning uh i want to say was it was it actually page one uh yeah it's on page one the second quote there is just that says that if there's going to be a revolution there's got to be a revolutionary party and uh the revolutionary party's got to be built on marxist leninist leninist revolutionary theory and then the other part that stuck out to me was that uh, he highlighted defeating imperialism which I learned uh, in some of the other reading was a kind of a priority of Mao's versus uh, capitalism in particular that he, a lot of this, and you see it throughout the text is focused on defeating imperialism rather than capitalism as uh, his personal perspective was that was the more immediate and larger concern uh, for the, the people that he was representing, representing. It's interesting too, because like I mentioned, I, I mentioned that as well. I picked up on that. Like there's a very heavy emphasis on imperialism, uh, U.S. imperialism, and also the defeat of the feudal like ruling <laughs> groups um, to reclaim the land and things like that. There is, there is a slightly different focus um, in ways that I think we haven't seen in other texts that we've read that have primarily focused on um, imperialism and it's, or excuse me, not imperialism, but capitalism pretty explicitly. Um, but then also recognizing obviously that imperialism is an offshoot of capitalist practice. But I think what we've seen in a lot of our other readings is a focus on capitalism, a framing around anti-capitalist thought, and then, then a discussion of the sort of offshoot. So things like racism, sexism, et cetera. Whereas in this text, he foregrounds, or it's foregrounded in this idea of, uh, and based on this idea of anti-imperialism, which yeah, I mean, it's relevant, right? Like it remains, mm -hmm. unfortunately, um, very real and very relevant to this day. Um, and so I think it's, that's another reason why the book kind of feels as we're reading it, despite some of the references to like the peasantry and stuff, it does still feel very relevant um, to this time and thinking about, for example, the US as an actively imperialist country, what that does to other places and perhaps what is happening in those countries, who is their Mao? You know, like what is, what is the, what is the school of thought or set of thoughts that people are formulating to oppose what types of U.S. imperialism we have happening now um, and who are going to be the people that emerge from that and what can we learn from them as well going forward? And I think we're seeing so many movements right now around the world um, that are happening as we speak that I think can give us a clue into that, um, especially stuff that's happening in Latin America as of late. Um, a few ideas can can be, you know, um, picked up from that alone. One of the first quotations, I mean, there were several in the early, early parts, but I think the one that stood out to me the most was the one that kind of made me do a double take. Um, so this is on page 10. This comes from Mao's uh, statement supporting the American Negroes in their just struggle against racial discrimination by U.S. imperialism. Um, this is a speech that he gave, or excuse me, a book 
that he, it's like, in, excuse me, it's cited in a book that was written in 1963. And I believe it's from a speech of the same year. Um, but he, he mentions here, I'm going to just read the quote in full. He says, quote, in the final analysis, national struggle is a matter of class struggle. Among the whites in the United States, it is only the reactionary ruling circles who oppress the black people. They can in no way represent the workers, farmers, revolutionary intellectuals, and other enlightened persons who comprise the overwhelming majority of white people, end quote. So I flagged this and I was like, not quite. Um, <laughs> it's like, oh, I don't know about that. I, I think he's right in terms of saying that obviously um, reactionary ruling circles, the upper class, do not have any way to represent people who are workers and economic people of any race. I mean, I just don't think their, their interests are not the same as ours um, and they certainly cannot represent us. But what I think is fascinating is um, he kind of, I mean, I, I think he's in some ways, perhaps just because he's coming at it as an, as a person who's not from the United States, right. Who's not seeing things on the ground in quite the same way. Um, and I think also as someone who's thinking more optimistically, so he's trying to kind of say, I think project onto the situation in the U S this is what, how you should be thinking, right? Like if you're a lower economic, if you're a person of lower income or working class white, you should be allied with black people instead of see seeing them as the enemy or like, you know what I mean? Um, I think in some ways he's projecting onto the situation what he wants to see as opposed to the reality at the time. So if you're looking at 1963, there are these sorts of interracial um, multi-class coalitions that are forming, but there are still problems within them with white um, white people and even problems beyond them, right, with white people being raped and expressing racist ideas racism and discrimination um, towards towards black people and other people of color. Um, and I think also that, you know, I, I am not sure that you could have said at the time and even now that the overwhelming majority of white people were these like, you know, people who were like high minded uh, and anti racist or whatever, who wanted to fight oppression and help black people, which is kind of what he, the picture that he paints. Um, and I'm like, that's not quite what was happening. I mean, you saw, unfortunately, and continue to see um, that there were white people who were of lower economic means, but who decided that their whiteness um, and the access that that gives them to some degree, marginally, but to some degree, um, was more important than aligning themselves, listening to and fighting for and alongside uh their comrades of color. And I think in the US in particular, this was a problem precisely because obviously our history of slavery and indigenous oppression and things like that. Um, but it it's it's fascinating to me to kind of see his outside perspective on what was happening here. And perhaps I think lent to be generous, to lend to him some, it seems like he's trying to be optimistic and think about a future as opposed to necessarily assessing a present. For the present at that time. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree, I agree with everything you said there as well. And it, it, in some ways, it felt like it was more written towards uh, the, a white audience in the United States than the audience that actually listened and received it well, uh, which mm -hmm. was uh, like the Black Panthers and various others. It was explicitly part of a statement in support of the, essentially the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And so like it, it was definitely intended to be a, a, a statement of support. And I think it kind of suffered from some of the things that you mentioned, you know, uh, his position in relative to the United States and the experiences. Whereas uh, I think when you look at uh, some of the writing on uh, of Mao within Chinese culture, I think it, it shows uh, more of an understanding of those dynamics as they kind of uh, map on to, to the degree they can, the situations in China. Mm -hmm. And so like, uh, for like dealing with the struggling struggles of the lack of infrastructure and so on and so forth and what that meant to even just spreading the message uh, and getting people on board with uh, uh, seeing things from a similar perspective and so on and so forth, uh, including the distribution of this text uh, in the front. I guess one of the other things that jumped out at me uh, in this first uh, 10 pages or so was he mentions uh, faith and says, uh, we must have faith in the masses and we must have faith in the party. And these are two cardinal principles. And if we doubt these principles, we shall accomplish nothing. And so I guess part of me 
part of my reaction was, you know, it's like, I, I don't like faith concerns me, but then I immediately reached back to Paulo Freire and when he said, talked about faith and says th that, uh, that dialogue requires faith in humankind and that like, we have to have faith in their power to make our, our power to make and remake the world, but that it's not a blind faith that it's not naive and is reckon and recognizes the situation that capitalism, imperialism, colonialism, all these things, how they impact our ability to engage with our ability to make the world. So, you know, how they affect our ability to, to imagine what's possible, our political imagination and, and just literally when it comes to what we can accomplish on the ground, you know, uh, if, whether it's you know Castro in Cuba or a variety of other revolutions throughout history, it's uh, there are plenty of people that made very convincing sounding cases about the impossibility of what uh, ended up actually happening. And so, uh, I think that that faith is not a blind faith, but it's critically important to uh, to the whole endeavor. And I think it also uh, dovetails with revolutionary optimism to the point uh, about the quote that you selected. Uh, I also heard a, a parallel between Mao and Hampton it, on page six, where he talks about policy being the starting point uh, of a revolutionary party and uh, essentially speaks to the importance of education as part of a revolutionary movement and not, you know, indoctrination into a capitalist system type education, but a, a critical dialogue and engagement and analysis of our material conditions and our ability to, to change them in the ways that we want. And then also the very practical practices involved in uh, both extracting those desires from the people and understanding them and then uh, taking them and uh, turning them into uh, improved material conditions. It's also fascinating when you bring up Hampton as well. Um, and again, we'll, we'll get into this more in the third section, but just about the ways that um, the Chinese revolution in particular was, and, and Maoism, and I think sort of like the, the Eastern approach, again, not my words, but like things that were used, you know, concepts at the time, this idea of the Eastern versus Western approach to imperialism and anti-capitalist thought and things like that. And how some, in some ways, ironically, the kind of racial, um, proximity, I guess you will, like people saying, okay, we're people of color, they're people of color. Some, sometimes that aspect of the Chinese revolution and Mao's thought had um, more of an impact precisely because of that. And so some people, um, and I know this is the case with, with some strains of communism in Latin America as well, look to this, um, this area, look to parts of Cuba, look or not Cuba, but Cuban history, I should say, um, look to even thought in Africa as something that was more approximate to their experience and that they could more closely relate and then apply, which I think is, is interesting. I, mean, I say ironically, just because it kind of goes, it falls back on these like, you know, like kind of standard identity politics ways of thinking about stuff, or at least identity focus. But at the same time, it's, it's interesting that like some revolutionary thinkers had to hear things from people that they saw as closer to their, as, as having some sort of proximity or, or closeness to their personal experiences in Americas as people of color and oppressed groups. Um, and that being the kind of entry point for them to learn more about uh, leftism. And I think that's why my, I always emphasize the necessity for us to read a variety of different types of people. Um, and that, and also to understand that like, left ideology is not something that's just relegated to Europe. And that's not to say that there's something wrong with left ideology that comes out of Europe, but I think it changes sometimes people's perspectives when they recognize that, oh, wait, like other people who may have experienced racism or discrimination on the basis of their ethnic identity or whatever, were also thinking like this. They may have had a slightly different approach, but the ideas were very, you know, they were very in line with one another. Um, because I think sometimes just on the basis of the oppression that many groups of color have experienced, it's sometimes not relatable. If you're like, here, read this book by, I mean, I don't, again, I, this phrase is like annoying, but read this book by this dead old white man, right? As opposed to saying, oh no, there's a contemporary, there's someone who's alive right now still who, come, who came from your same neighborhood or who came from your environment or who experienced things that are similar to you has a set of left ideologies that may impact you right now that you can read 
Um, and so I think that's why it's always really important for us to engage with a variety of different perspectives, um, even if they're sometimes kind of getting, they're, they're all, at the end of the day, they're getting at a lot of the same points. Um, but that entry point is important. I think on that note, uh, he has on page 31, a section where he talks about how to connect what he calls middle peasants and working class and lower, you know, the lower peasantry or the poor peasantry. Um, mm-hmm. And, and you know, again, I don't know, I don't, I, I'm working around this because I think there's sometimes some parts of me that I really agree with this. And other times I'm like, I don't know, is that really, I don't know. But he has, he has a section where he says um, basically that, that the people who will be most um, equipped and, and I think, uh, you know, not just, not just equipped, but just better at, um, converting middle peasants are those who are the poorer peasants. So, and I, and I definitely agree with this in the sense that I think these revolutionary movements, these kinds of, um, even, even discussions and things like that should be led ultimately by people who are experiencing the, the brunt of this oppression, right? They know it firsthand. They experience it on a regular basis. They may not necessarily have the quote unquote language that appeals to certain groups or that people are conditioned to recognizing as valid or most important, right? So, you know, oh, this person doesn't have a PhD or isn't a professor at Harvard. So sometimes people dismiss what that person has to say. And I think what Mao's getting at here is that it doesn't matter what what their credentials are that are on paper, it's about the credentials of their lived experiences. And so he talks about, um, he says that, um, that in the case of struggles against landlords for land reform and changes that were being made in the countryside against capitalism and things like that to, to quote, achieve the socialist transformation of agriculture, it was people who were the poorest who were the ones that needed to be heard the most. Um, and he says here, quote, at the end of that quotation, um, he says that, it is only after they clearly see the general, he's talking about middle peasants right now. It's only after that they literally, they, sorry, let me restart. It is only after they clearly see the general trend of events and the approaching triumph of the revolution that the middle peasants will come in on the side of the revolution. The poor peasants must work on the middle peasants and win them over so that the revolution will broaden from day to day until final victory. And I think that that, I mean, you know, and again, it kind of, it's, it's one of those things where I'm like, is it, is it there, is it the role of poor people or the most oppressed to influence and change the middle peasants? Or is it something that they may not, the middle peasants may not even realize until they themselves are on the, at the brink of suffering? Um, I have questions about this. I mean, I, in, in theory, I think it's very good and important that lower classes lead these movements. No doubt about that. I agree with that. But I also wonder if on the back end of that, that there's a level of placing an undue burden on those who are already the most oppressed to then at the same time have to influence and and um, change the way of thinking of those who may be able to express some power over them. Or, if is, it, or is it something that those people who are kind of in the middle, who are comfortable, if they need to realize on their own. Do you get what I'm saying? Like who's, whose mm. role is it? Do they need to hear it from people like themselves or is it the role? Is it yet another thing that oppressed people have to do? Because I feel like sometimes what we run up against, there's a, a real, a very real wall and division when oppressed people are trying to express what is happening to them. Um, it gets ignored. It gets blindsided, obscured um, and relegated to an area where it's just their problem. It's not our problem. And so I wonder sometimes, does it also then instead take someone from the middle classes or the upper classes speaking to one another to say, hey, look at your experience there. Maybe we should care about what's happening to them before it happens to us or whatever the fuck might be. Um, I don't know. Like, what do you think about that? Because you, you were, it seems like in the beginning, mm-hmm. you were also kind of like doing a, a verbal nod, if you will. Um, yeah. So. No, uh, absolutely. I, I I think that it goes on to talk, uh, kind of address some of what I think is there later on, just after that, I think on page 32 to before 33. And then also, I feel I, I have that kind of unease at the situation and kind of framing myself. 
and I, from what I gather, is that like, or I guess my impression is that it's going to be the 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 people that are being exploited the most that are going to have the most uh, revolutionary fervor, mm-hmm. and so they're going to be the ones that, that are are there to do the work in that way, and so it. I feel some of the like kind of unfortunate, you know, kind of, I don't know, the burden of caring or whatever in sense that like, because the, they're the ones who are being affected, they're going to be the ones that are going to need to convince people. But I also see what you're saying in that uh, once they've broken into some of the middle peasants, it that the middle peasants may be more effective at convincing other middle peasants in some ways uh, to see on board and the kind of like modern or contemporary parallel that, I process that through is everybody you always either make too little or make too much money to be a socialist and not a hypocrite. <laughs> like you, You're either jealous of the people that have succeeded under capitalism or you are a hypocrite because you succeeded under capitalism and are uh, critiquing it and in opposition of it. And there's no, never an appropriate amount of wealth uh, or income that for a socialist to have from people that are critical of socialism right like yeah go ahead no no no. i was just gonna say also like because i think about a lot of these you know online movements or sort of pop pop socialism that's led by and void like the people at the helm are people who i would look at and say you're my freaking class enemy you know like how do you kind of address that um and and i think as well the other thing it makes me think about is sometimes um I think what ends up happening too is that because of the incredibly influential propaganda from the upper classes, there's a degree to which people who are suffering and oppressed, instead of seeing it as a, as a space for revolution or as a time for revolution, throw up their hands and say, you know what, I just want to make money at the end of the day. I just want to be rich like everybody else. And there's not that revolutionary forever. It's certainly something that we see in the United States, you know, um, because I think we've been brainwashed to believe that capitalism is our way out. It's our exit, despite the fact that oftentimes capitalism just kind of ends up eating everyone in the end, you know, like it swallows everyone whole. Um, I don't think a lot of the people that wrote at this time really imagine the U S and capitalism at the point that it is now. I mean, right. (laughs) Even other capitalist countries throughout Europe, like the, like we have drug commercials. That's, that's not a thing virtually anywhere else in the world. Like it's criminal in a lot of the world, like the idea, but it's just common main place to hear, you know, Hey, why don't you ask your doctor for these drugs? And uh, by the way, they might cause X, Y, Z and elemental P, you know? Right. 30,000 side effects. Um, But yeah, I mean, cause we're right now we're, what we're seeing is like a very gross exaggeration, uh, exaggerated form of capitalism that is, as you said, beyond kind of the imaginations, perhaps, of, of people writing at this time. Um, but I think that, that that that's, again, like, I always have these sort of questions in the back of my mind, like, what do you do if, in the case of, um, you know, the, the, the person who is at the bottom, the oppressed person who says, perhaps... Like who, who not, and, and again, I don't, it's not like a, a matter of blaming them. Right. I think, but the issue is if you're so oppressed that you, you just want relief. Right. And you don't care how that relief comes. And you sometimes are like, so for that, you don't want to necessarily fight anymore. You've already you spent your whole life fighting. Right. And so you're just like, I just, just, I want, I want to be like that celebrity or like that famous person or whatever. Um, and that's what you aspire to as opposed to like a sort of dream that involves like freeing yourself and your peers. And then on top of that, having the burden of like getting people who are slightly above you in class Mm -hmm. to also recognize your struggle and join you. I think that it's sometimes the way, I mean, again, being playing devil's advocate here, right. Um, How does that, what does that look like then? Um, And how do you, how do you reach someone who thinks like that? Like, I just need a bigger paycheck. I don't, I don't care about the revolution. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, There's a larger theme there, I think in capitalism and in other system feudalism that we've seen throughout history, the precursors to capitalism of uh, an exploited class and that exploited class uh, reaching some sort of revolutionary fervor uh, or it being like qualmed by uh, various internal factions. And then also, uh, as uh, Mao mentions in the 
like, that same section is 32, that there's a serious tendency towards capitalism among the well-to-do peasants. Mm-hmm. And that th- this tendency it can become rampant and basically says that we've got to confront it consistently and also even in a post-revolutionary period or, or else all progress can be lost. That also reminds me of some of the things that Hampton says in that little bit about education as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is just kind of an inspirational uh, quote or like a little segment of speeching or speech from Hampton for me. So it's like, it's what key, what I like, what a lot of things end up keying in on. Uh, But I think that it's kind of a recognition that uh, if those people don't do the work, it won't get done. The, Mm -hmm. the middle peasants aren't going to do it. Like it, that, they aren't going to have reached a revolutionary consciousness, a class consciousness. They aren't going to do this on their own. They're only going to do it by essentially the uncomfortable confrontations between them and, and poorer peasants in the, in confronting the contradictions between what they say, they believe what they say, they support what they say, they think, and the, the realities of the world and the policies that are enacted in their name and uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, he definitely, I mean, he, on the one hand, it's like half of it feels like a burden, but then on the other half, it feels like he really entrusts and believes in. It's almost like a, like, I value more what the poor peasant has to say. And thus, I think that person is best suited to lead, which is also Mm -hmm. something that comes from, like, you see this in in Gramsci as well. Um, You know, Italian leftist, he has a lot of stuff about the quote unquote organic intellectual or the person who comes from the lower classes who can then lead, who's the best suited to lead them, you know, because he, he or she understands the conditions, he or she has lived them, and he or she can better um, sort of address solutions uh, for their issues. And I think that that, and also just kind of recognizing the value of like what I was saying earlier, the person who knows the most doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily match to the person who has the most credentials, right? The most like credentials on paper, the formal ideas of what we think as, um, you know, credentials in a capitalist system, right? That that pride from your neighborhood. That there's a priority of proximity and not just Mm -hmm. like the superficial proximity, but like a real, like close uh, engagement and and entanglement with the issues of the masses. Exactly. Um, And I think, the other thing, like going back to this idea of, you know, the poor peasantry again, um, he has a section on, he's, he gets into these, like, he like waxes poetic a little bit sometimes. He has, it has some artistic flares here and there, which was kind of surprising because normally, you know, when you read, um, you know, any sort of political text, it's going to be kind of, I don't want to say dry, but there's normally not a lot of like, florid language right it's not very artsy you're like reading about conditions and theories and things like that so it can be a little bit harsh or dry um but he has these moments in the text where he it's like he describes things through metaphor um and it's almost it's it's rather beautiful i think um so on page Mm. 36 he has i think this is 36 let me double check uh yeah on page 36 he has a quotation in the middle of the page um where he says uh, basically he dismisses this idea that poor people are just blank, like empty. Right. But then he, he turns the, he turns that idea on his head, on its head. And he talks about the potential of poor people. Um, and he says, poverty gives rise to the desire for change, the desire for action and the desire for revolution on a blank sheet of paper, free from any mark, the freshest and most beautiful characters can be written. The freshest and most beautiful pictures can be painted. And like, that's so beautiful. You know what I mean? Like, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's very, it's, it's a cool way to think about like revolution itself, right? As this flower growing or this picture being painted or something like beginning from scratch and starting over. And I think that that's really, it's like a, it's such a cool image because I think, again, we think of revolution as this painful, bloody, you know, terrible act. In, not terrible in, term, in terms of the long run, but just the act of getting there. And I think that that, that his framing of this process is also being something that's beautiful and that's like a piece of art is really important for like, it's a cool way to think about, you know, revolution. Like, yeah, it's going to be bloody, but it's also going to be the beginning of something amazing. And it's going to be a way to rewrite and reframe what we knew, empty it out, clear it and start with something more beautiful than we, than we had in the past. 
Yeah, no, and I, I keyed in on that as well, and I felt as though I, I did some reading ahead or whatever about the context of uh, some of this stuff, and then uh, one of the things that came up, there's a cultural significance to both the format and kind of presentation of the mm-hmm. book in general, and then also it, that moment, just it just felt, you know, very kind of poetic and art, artistic to me in a way that I felt like, I didn't come across in most Western uh, uh, kind of uh, presentations of these ideas. Mm -hmm. And so it felt like going back to the kind of where we started uh, about like having a different perspective angle into some of the very same ideas that we've been studying from a variety of authors, I feel like gives us these types of insights. And so like, and then also I was just going to say, I think a lot of this being pulled from speeches it's where he, you know, he's speaking to an audience helps make it kind of have that, that kind of, I don't know, visceral appeal versus more like a lot of the text that we've read. It wouldn't be something that you, it's not exactly a Ted talk, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, so like, I feel like the, that also, there's some benefits to that within this text as well. For sure. Um, I also like that he goes on throughout, I mean, a few many pages later, but um, this is like in the 70s, 72, I'm sorry, um, I'm looking at my PDF pages, but 50, 53, 54, 55, that area. He talks a lot in that section about the ways to talk about these issues with people um, and the necessity for us to have these kinds of exchanges, discussions, to educate one another. Um, and he says, you know, to, he says, quote, to treat comrades like enemies is to go over the stand of the enemy and or to go over to the stand of the enemy. And I think it's it's interesting that um, he reinforces this idea of like change cannot happen solely by the barrel of a gun. Right. You have to also discuss things. You have to change people's minds. You have to influence people. You have to educate them. You have to speak to them. You have to listen to them. I mean, he says throughout the text. Um, that you're basically a shit leader <laughs> if you don't listen to what the people need and understand their side of things and change based on that, you know. Um, and despite, I think, some of the, despite some of the, um, I think, stereotypes about left leftism in general, right? This, especially in the United States where you have this idea of like, oh my God, socialism is this like authoritarian repressive system and everything is top down and, you know, there's no, no consideration of what people have to say from the bottom and whatever. Throughout this book <laughs> and many of the other things we've read, there's reminder after reminder after reminder that dialogue and listening and engaging people directly is key to change, to revolutionary change, right? Um, and that that not everything is just action. I mean, again, it's it's but like they all say this right everybody's getting at the end of the day talking about how there's got to be more than just acting without thought and listening and I really I don't know again I think in this section as well he gets into saying things that are very artistically expressed um, and that would make like (laughs) in a capitalist system very cool t-shirts right there it's kind of like (laughs) these (laughs) these little quotes that you can grab here and there but they're they're beautiful and I think it's a really nice way if we're gonna if we're gonna think about revolution as something that is also a genesis, um, it's a really nice way to kind of kind of reframe the ideas and, and the methods of of getting to change. No, I, I, I think so as well. And in the section between forties and the the fifties, kind of goes into what I think a lot of people that are getting into various socialist ideas kind of struggle with, which is they see a lot of references to the masses, to the people, and they immediately think of all of the people in like around them that have very different perspectives of what the, what we need to change in the, in our country or world or whatever. And uh, they grapple or wrestle with understanding how you can represent the masses, but also kind of, uh, you know, deal with these, what are essentially kind of viewed as just bad or, counterproductive or reactionary ideas Mm -hmm. and it's in that section that i think he kind of touches on some of that and while i don't think either of our views map directly onto any one particular person that we've read and 
these authors, I know Marx specifically and Mao also both uh, at some point said, you know, not to add an ism to the end of their name and, and to go with that. And so I don't think that they believe that they had the entirety of all this thing, all of this summed up and all the answers to these questions either. But <laughs> there there is some very valuable information in there. Uh, and it talks about, I think, you know, and I, it also there's a historical context that also is colored by all the things that we talked about before that I think it's worth actually for people to engage that particular part of the text themselves in general and really re- read through that section and, and see how they feel about it. But essentially, it, it a lot of it boils down to the same things that we've been hearing before, which is uh, bringing up the contradictions and having a, a dialogue, a sincere dialogue and critical dialogue about those contradictions and really like not trying to force people into that, but being able to identify when people are ready and taking advantages or taking advantage of when material circumstances uh, make that more likely or more or people more susceptible to hear those things. And then also to have the right arguments that are prepared and not deceitful or manipulative in the kind of, in the way of the bourgeoisie, but that are just effective messaging mass lines to address what people are confronting with the material conditions that they're dealing with in their lives. Mm -hmm. I think too, going back just a tad, because you mentioned like there are certain, there's sections, there's a section between um, like around in the forties or so uh, that stood out to you. I think that there's also around that same time, a really big focus on the idea of the dictatorship of the people, which is something that you may have heard, like you being Mm -hmm. the listener, but people may have heard or seen thrown around. um, And he really, he gets into kind of a deeper breakdown of what that really means. Um, and I think that that is also important to keep in mind when we think once again about sort of historical representations of um, socialism as an idea, like as a, as a broader abstract idea and how that's often distorted uh, within a capitalist country to mean something that is authoritarian or forceful or, um, you know, a, just a plain dictatorship, right? Whereas his emphasis is like, no, working class people and people at the bottom, basically like the economic bottom, those who are the most oppressed are the ones who can lead us into a more like equal society. Um, and I think that he, when he talks about this idea of, of the dictatorship of the people, it's not in the traditional sense that we think of a dictatorship where we're like, do what I say, you know, but instead listen, like taking the voices of the most oppressed, like listening to what they're saying and implementing a, based on their experiences, something that makes things like that not repeat themselves, right? Like to make sure that that oppression doesn't come forth again. Um, and, and in that sense, the dictatorship idea is more one about democracy. And he does, he talks a lot about democracy as well, which is really cool. Like throughout, he literally calls it um, on one of the pages here, let's see, page 39, he says that he calls it a people's democratic dictatorship, which is like, what? (laughs) You know, like when you read that, you're like, those (laughs) things seem contradictory. But the way he frames the dictatorship part is what makes it democratic because it's coming from the people. It's coming from engagement and dialogue and things like that and listening. And so he says here, the quote, the people's democratic dictatorship needs the leadership of the working class. For it is only the working class that is most farsighted, most selfless, and most thoroughly revolutionary. Um, And he says the entire history of revolution proves that without the leadership of the working class, revolution fails. And that with the leadership of the working class, revolution triumphs. And that is like, I mean, it's real. You know, if you do, if you really do kind of think about history, even things that came well after he said this, because he said this in 1949. um, But if you think about things, the revolutions that happened after the fact, you know, in, in many parts of the world, the people who kind of got the, the fire started, we're the most oppressed. And I think that that's why sometimes when we, I've I've heard this excuse of like, oh, but if you're that oppressed, you don't have time to read or you don't have time to start a revolution or whatever. I mean, there's like, there are a lot of like really weird uh, sayings that people just throw around without having thought about the fact that like, so what are you talking about? Like so many revolutions were led by enslaved people, impoverished people, colonized peoples, you know? So it's really, I think, an inspiring way to think, to rethink this idea of what left ideology means in practice. And I think that the 
democratic dictatorship is kind of a cool way of framing it. Like, I don't know. I kind of, I just, I really like the the expression itself and the way that he articulates that. Oh yeah. And I think it, it carries well into kind of his discussion on, uh, like the role that war plays within revolution in that essentially, and he says it a variety of ways uh, throughout the text, but uh, basically that revolutionaries have to be ready for war, not be afraid of war, but it, see it as a last resort. You know, it was like always wanting to avoid war, but not shying away from it and recognizing that like it, it, it could come to that. And then also, uh, I guess it's kind of in juxtaposition or kind of uh, some people may see it as hypocritical or whatever, but also talks about, says specifically on page 65, the guns of the Russian communist party created socialism. And so like it goes on to talk about, uh, we shall create a democratic Republic. And, but it also basically mentions that uh, the masses in order to defeat armed bourgeoisie and uh, landlords in this sense, uh, we may say that only with guns can the whole world be transformed. So there's a, I think an emphasis and a prioritization of dialogue and peace and of uh, engagement and of all those types of things, but also a recognition uh, that there is a segment of society that is committed to uh, fighting just as hard to preserve the institution status quo that uh, base their, that they base their power in and that there has to be at some point a line drawn and action taken and it it's about i think both engaging in that dialogue and recognize and making sure that it's the will of, of the people that is uh dictating that in such a way that it's not just a blind will of the people based on a blind faith but a an informed faith based on an informed people that are engaged and as it opened in the very beginning of the text informed by a marxist leninist approach of both critical analysis uh, of your actions and then as throughout it a uh, critical engagement of your own practices and constantly engaging and analyzing what it is that you're doing but also uh, going forth with firm resolution when a decision has been made yeah he has that he has a lot of that throughout especially towards the end of the sections that we read um, when he starts talking about the military and the role of of like armed struggle and things like that, um, he has a lot of emphasis on like, you know, um, we need to be armed <laughs> and we need to be able to fight to defend this, you know, democratic dictatorship. But at the same time, we can't let that be the only governing principle by which we live, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that that is, it's interesting because I think on the one hand, you know, there's a certain strain of, um, leftist ideology that's very pacifist and that says there should be no conflict ever. Um, and that, you know, the, and, and, you know, feel however you want to feel about that. Um, but I think the framing here is interesting because he basically doesn't abandon the prospect of war. He says it shouldn't be the only thing we do. Um, but it, it's often necessary if we want radical change. Um, and I think sometimes there is a reluctance to acknowledge that. Because I think people think that sometimes everything is going to be solved with words. Um, but the reality is in some some areas and some aspects of our societies that this sense of power, the power structure itself is so entrenched, deeply entrenched, in fact, that there is no way to undo it without armed struggle, you know, without an actual literal war um, to change things. I mean, we've seen that throughout history, but it's definitely a, a, an interesting reminder throughout the text that there are multiple approaches. One of them is, is war. Um, I think to just add to that, um, I really like this. I think this is in the eighties, 86. He has a line where he kind of, he, he talks about basically the, the problem that we have sometimes of trying to sensibly debate um, these power structures and sensibly, he says, you know, um, kind of, have hope for uh, liberation by kind of listening to and kowtowing to the demands of imperialists. And I really like that part because I was thinking about, you know, all the stuff that's going on with like right now, Michelle Obama um, came out and said that she has, she shares values with George W. Bush. Um, and, 
you know, Obama has said things like repeatedly, you know, not to protest, not to complain. He's against cancel culture, this, that, and the third. And I think it's fascinating to think about the ways that, you know, we have not still, we still have not abandoned the people that are helping oppress us. Basically, we haven't given up on them. I mean, I have, but I think some people are still holding on to this idea that, you know, maybe they're right a little bit, or maybe they're going to change, or maybe, you know, they said this one thing that one time that I didn't like, but other than that, it's probably fine. Like he didn't really mean that. He's just saying that because it's 10 dimensional chess or whatever. I mean, there's no one with a gun to Michelle Obama's head saying, come out and talk about your friendship with George W. Bush and, you know, rationalize him as a person. Right. Um, And I think that that, that, I don't know that it just kind of resonated with me because it's something that's like in the news right now, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think also we've gotten to this habit where like, we think a debate will fix everything. Like having, we should, that we should debate our oppressor instead of fighting against them. <laughs> like This mm-hmm. is a different, and, and I think that he, he explicitly is against that former approach of, of engaging in just a, a friendly little debate or, you know, um, maybe I should understand their side. Like, no, they're trying to kill you literally in some cases they're, they're oppressing you. And so there has to be a cutting off point where we say, look, we, these are our demands. These are our needs. This is what we need as a society. And you're holding us back and we don't need to give into that in order to succeed. We have to actually challenge it. And so I, I, I don't know. It was kind of, it was nice to see that. I mean, he said this in, in 1963, he was talking about Vietnam um, and, Mm -hmm you know, like there's no need to, for us to pretend that what the U S is doing in Vietnam is somehow sensible or reasonable. Like you have to fight the suppressor. And so I, I don't know, I really appreciated that. And I think it's something that definitely applies in the present. No, definitely. It's like, as we see in South and Latin America, U S imperialism raging yet again. And like, I think of uh, the quote from page 85, it says it starts with, quote we are for peace period mm-hmm. like that's that we are for peace but so long as the u.s imperialism refuses to give up on its uh, arrogant and unreasonable demands and its scheme to extend aggression the only course for the chinese people is to remain determined to go on fighting side by side with the korean people not that we are warlike we are willing to stop the war at once and leave the remaining questions for later settlement but u.s imperialism is not willing to do so all right then let the fighting go on like yeah that, that kind of speaks to i think what is the well theme said. of <laughs> yeah you know it's like it's like we want peace we like that's what we want but if you're going to fight we're we're ready to fight and we're not going to back down and we will we'll be here fighting for as long as it takes for you to recognize that this isn't going to stop and it's it's uh it says it goes on however many years U.S. imperialism wants to fight. We're ready. And we're in the moment it's ready, willing to stop. We, so are we, essentially. <laughs> like, yeah. And yeah. so, like, I think uh, for all for accusations uh, uh, of various people throughout the world that have stood up to American imperialism uh, is like if uh, American imperialism stops, then you have another the, the, there's another question to be had. But so long as the American imperialism is active and raging then it, the for me the priority is addressing the american imperialism it, rather than especially as an american critique the social order of a, a country that we're my my tax dollars my pol- politicians are actively trying to destroy right absolutely yeah i mean i think and yes that is that is true and i think that there is that section in particular, he also goes into, if I'm not mistaken, like talking about always being prepared for a fight if necessary, like don't get into a fight that you can't win basically. And to Mm -hmm. always be prepared for what can come of that fight. And yeah, I think that there's absolutely um, significance in a statement like that. And what you had mentioned as well about, you know, until you take your boot off my neck, I'm not going to stop fighting, you know, like, and I think there's always this sort of refrain of like, why are they, I, I mean, there's, there's a type of criticism in many cases of, of countries that are being oppressed by American imperialism. And there's a criticism of some of their approaches and things like that. And I'm like, do you think this is really the time for that? Like they are fighting a war against 
the biggest superpower in the world. And yet you're taking the time to criticize a leader for making it the decision that you didn't exactly love. I mean, this is, it feels, it feels selfish and it feels short-sighted. And I think his statement that you mentioned above um, earlier is like, it's, it's important because I think it just reminds us of that, right? That element of like, you have every right to fight for your sovereignty, for your country's right to exist, for your people, you know, um, and we can't abandon that just to be, I don't know, to just like have a fight for fight's sake, like have a, have a little petty argument. We have to uh, defend the rights of, of these countries to defend themselves um, against imperialism and powers like that. Um, I don't know, but I, I, yeah, I agree. I agree with Mao in this case. <laughs> right. <laughs> Check mark. Yes. Like, and, um, I guess quickly just on that point, he also mentions that the army must, that's got to fight for, has to have a conscious discipline. He also mentions at another point about like a progressive military mm-hmm. and uh, that as well as a labor army and uh, essentially with he says with these two types of armies and a fighting army skilled with these two tasks and in mass work we can overcome our difficulties and in this case it says and defeat japanese imperialism and so i think that that's an important aspect too is that it's not always just about the fighting but he also uses army to refer to uh labor and and the workers that are doing all of the infrastructure and uh, logistics stuff that it takes to both maintain an army and then also a society once the fighting's done yeah, it's more, it's like not just one specific task, but it's kind of recognizing that the fight is a holistic fight, right? Like it's the whole, mm-hmm. so- the whole society is the army in this case, if you're fighting imperialism. Um, but I th- yeah, that's, that's definitely a, you know, a good way of, of explaining it. And also I think it just kind of gives everyone a sense of personal responsibility in ways that we don't necessarily think of if we're looking at capitalists military endeavors right because if if you're talking about a capitalist military you're talking about some like a group of people who are out basically fighting for not themselves and not their society like the health of their society but to enrich people at the top you know like to enrich um the war machine military industrial complex politicians etc who gain from you know weapon sales and shit and oil um whereas i think in this case when he's talking more about defense so not not invasion, not, um, you know, like occupation of another place, but a defense of what you have and what you have built as a, as a group of people. And so I think that that is a very like it's a, it's a cool way of thinking of rethinking, I should say, um, the role of individuals in society as well. Not just, you know, as as people who are going to, quote unquote, fight for their country, but they're not even fighting for their country. They're just fighting for people at the top with money who don't care what happens to them. And yeah, like sometimes literally and not even uh, behind the scenes for corporate profits or literal corporate access to a particular resource or market within a country. Right. Right. Um, The other thing I I just wanted to touch on, at least in terms of my, um, I don't know, quotations that I liked um, or that I thought were interesting in this, these last couple of, pages for our section that we read. Um, I thought once again, that there was a lot of, it just, I, I don't know when I was reading this, I heard, I heard so many Freirean moments, obviously this, there were aspects mm. of this that came out before Freire, Freire was writing anything. Um, and before his book was written, but there's a lot of just, I really like the discussion throughout about the back and forth necessary between leaders and the people um, and how the people then become the leaders. You know what I mean? There's a lot of, I, I think a lot of interesting um, explanations of how dialogue works and how engagement works um, in order to keep the society going and thriving and and also to keep the fight going um, against imperialism. And he has um, one page, I'm sorry, on page, let's see, page 154, um, he has another part that's a few pages up on page 129 throughout this second half of what we read, where he's talking a lot about what we have to learn from other people, um, how we have to engage other people, um, and also how to be good leaders among the people, like not to just tell people to do stuff, but also to listen, to discuss, he says, to adopt and carry out decisions and check up on the results. And it reminded me so much of this section in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, where Freire talks about kind of like 
I don't know how, I can't remember the exact phrasing he used, but he talks, he talks about researchers going into a community, right. And having these like listening sessions. Do you remember mm. that part? Mm -hmm. um, and how he's like, you can't just go into a place and say, this is what we're going to do. This is how it's going to be. I'm going to study you and, and then leave, but how it has to be an interactive engagement and a constant checking in with listening to being led by the local people and what their needs are. And I just thought that you know, throughout, we have a lot of this. Um, and, and he also uses that, he applies that same set of principles to the way that a, a, an anti-imperialist military has to operate um, and how they have to constantly be in touch, like leaders of these military actions have to be constantly in touch with the needs of the people, the needs of their armed forces. The, you know what I mean? It's kind of like this, it's a whole system. It's not just, um, you know, one segment of society that's going off and doing one thing and another segment that's doing another thing. I think it's really cool how he kind of makes it this one big whole system uh, way or system system view of thinking about the society and how it operates. Yeah, and I think that it's not like the kind of, I don't know how to describe it, but I guess, you know, it just feels like it, it touches on how capitalism in even its uh, most idealistic forms still results in mass human suffering. Whereas you can critique socialism's uh, or like the actual application of it in a variety of uh, circumstances. But uh, if you like under its ideal circumstances, it, it, if you're adhering to the kind of understandings of the, the critical engagements and the, the analysis and dialogue that, if even when it goes off track, it's much easier to correct than the systems under capitalism, because once they've gone off track, they've also co-opted and uh, and taken control over them and merely questioning them uh, becomes uh, very problematic. And so, like, uh, I, it's not that uh, socialism or socialist theory is immune from that, but uh, you'll always find you can always point to it to find that by ignoring that aspect it's ignoring itself whereas capitalism you won't find that you won't find the point that you can you won't find it in the inherent philosophy that uh there's something you can point to that says well we're doing it wrong because of this and like and that that and in correcting that will will improve the situation it's always just looking for a new group of people to exploit uh at best and uh to figure out how to silence the people that are being exploited cur currently and it's usually by uh taking segmenting us out a small section and lifting them up into the the middle uh, peasantry rather right. than uplifting the people that are stuck in the poor peasantry and turning them against each other and so i think that's uh, one of the key points that uh, is a struggle that we've seen throughout every one of these revolutionary struggles mm -hmm. Because there's always going to be, I mean, the, like you said, there's like, if even if you think about um, colonialism, this happened all the time, right? Where they would take, mm -hmm. they would pit, pluck out, you know, one or two leaders from the indigenous group and then make that person the face of, of oppression in that community. So that way it's sort of like an outsourcing of colonialism and an outsourcing of, of capitalist power in that system. And I think that that is absolutely something we still do, unfortunately. And we know it because we say like... Uh, you know, the, the, oh gosh, what do they call it? Um, I don't like the, it's not PMC that people use a lot, but there is the professional managerial class, but there's a certain aspect of this like PMC analysis that applies to people of color who have gone to Ivy league schools, who've gotten all these degrees, who've been members of the press or whatever, who then <clears throat> while using their voice to, um, using their identity, at least to seemingly represent an oppressed group, they actually end up reinforcing the needs and desires of the members of society who have the most power um, and actively engage in oppressing those of the group from which they came. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that is what you mentioned here kind of connects to this current day problem that we still have. Um, and, and Mao kind of offers some, potential solutions to that um, by keeping it from being just like a select group of people, but making it a, an entire social project. Um, I don't know. I think, but I, 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 yeah, I think it, it nicely applies to unfortunate issues. We have. Um, yeah. I don't know how to fix, at least not within a capitalist framework. You can't fix them. I mean, that's how capitalism works, but um, mm -hmm. we have to flip that and think about what the people need, not just, 
one person making it get quote unquote getting out and then speaking on everyone else's behalf poorly. Yeah, that is definitely a concern that I think we, as you said, we've seen and repeated throughout history. And uh, I think kind of just as how being informed by the masses and being deeply engaged with their issues uh, provides an informative and helpful aspect to socialist practice. I think capitalism definitely benefits from extracting people from those communities and coercing them through uh, engagement uh, in, in promotion within the system. And it helps reinforce within those people ideas of the meritocracy's validity and uh, because the people around them all start to think, think and say the same things and it makes it socially it, it they blend in more effectively by agreeing with these things than by maintaining the kind of connection to the issues that they remember before they were drafted into the bourgeoisie and so mm-hmm. I, I think that's definitely part of one of the like last quote for me that really stuck out uh that i think is also pertinent to today, although uh, it, it particularly does mention China specifically, uh, I think is also, but still, again, uh, pertinent to today is, quote, the present upsurge of the peasant movement is a colossal event. In a very short time in China's central, southern, and northern provinces, several hundred million peasants will rise like a mighty storm, like a hurricane, a force so swift and violent that no power, however great, will be able to hold it back. They will smash all the trammels that bind them and rush forward along the road to liberation. They will sweep all the imperialists, warlords, corrupt officials, local tyrants, and evil gentry into their graves. Every revolutionary party and every revolutionary comrade will be put to the test to be accepted or rejected as they decide. There are three alternatives. To march at their head and lead them. To trail behind them gesticulating and criticizing or to stand in their way and oppose them. Every Chinese is free to choose, but events will force you to make the choice quickly. And I just feel like that that's really the choice that we face uh, in a lot of ways uh, today, both in the United States and in a lot of ways globally, is that there is a line being drawn between the people and the imperialist warlords and corrupt officials and tyrants. And you can, it, you'll either be uh, at the forefront of it as part of it or in the back criticizing it or on the other side opposing it and uh i think when we really look at you know how we engage with various uh political entities and how we engage politically on the individual level and in our communities and so on and so forth i think looking through that lens of where where of those three where do we see ourselves uh, i think provides us an opportunity to uh, i guess engage in ways that are more likely to lead to our desired outcomes uh, as long as we keep these things in our mind it's that ever excuse me it's that ever present question of like whose side are you on which side are you on you know Mm -hmm. and there's there's often that idea of like if you're going to be a silent bystander you're with the enemy you know ultimately but i think also sometimes the outspoken critic also becomes with the enemy or becomes a part of the enemy because you're like kicking someone when they're down, you know? Um, and I think like, right. I mean, we, we can maybe get into this when we have our end of the year discussion. Um, but just like the events that we saw in Bolivia recently um, happened, the coup that happened. And while that was un- ongoing and very clear what was happening, there were some people who were like, well, what about nuance? Or like, well, sometimes Morales was wrong or sometimes, you know, and it's just like, are you serious right now? <laughs> like, are you for real? <laughs> exactly. There's an actual military coup happening. And then there's like a far right, hyper-religious, anti-indigenous set of people that are moving into power as we speak, like in real time right now happening. And your hand ringing over something that Morales said once, like 30 years ago that you didn't really like that much. I mean, it just, it felt so... Like that, I think that was like one of those really definitive moments for me when I'm looking at the situation saying, no, no, sometimes you need to know when to know when to express your criticism and and know when to, to be supportive of a country that's going through. And, and again, not just a leader, right? I think sometimes people reproduce it to leaders as sort of shorthand, you know, like I stand with Evo or stand with whatever person, but I think that, that leader 
becomes a stand-in for a country, for a group of people, for a society. And to, to expand that metaphor to then apply to the entire country, you're watching a country be um, you know, taken apart by people who want to destroy the majority of its population. And you're sitting there talking about these really seemingly minor things. And it's just, it's just as bad ultimately as defending the group of people that are doing, that are wreaking havoc, you know? Um, yeah. So I, yeah. I was just going to say that it's like, it's not <laughs> right wing reactionaries first rodeo either. It's like, right. they've been through these turmoil, this time, or the, this time of turmoil before and recognize the vulnerability it presents to their position and act to defend themselves. And one of the <laughs> ways that they do that is to try to muddy the waters and to make it seem and like to capitalize on the, the masses, uh, revolutionary zeal to displace a, a leader that uh, may or may not be meeting their expectations with not a, uh, a be- one that is better at that, but one that is uh, totally contrary to it. And exactly. they, they recognize like if they're in like for uh, right wing reactionaries that exist in countries that are more or less ruled by more left wing parties, they recognize these moments uh, as their opportunity to seize power as well. And so like they, they have strategies and plans and, and all these types of, uh, you know, uh, ways in which they try to capitalize on these movements and the type of uh, rhetoric that you were just describing is, is one of the ways that they, you, uh, the, the common phrasing in, in the contemporary times would be a, a useful idiot in mm-hmm. that it, like it is often associated with the uh, russian uh propaganda or whatever but it western propaganda has useful idiots too oh absolutely absolutely um and i i think that this you know again that's why i keep saying like sometimes people have to separate themselves from who wrote something or what the con- what the sort of contemporary issues were at the time and actually think about some of these readings as historical objects that then have have the value in the present. And I think that this is where we can kind of very easily apply some of the stuff that comes up in this book to very, very contemporary ongoing issues that we're looking at right now um, and kind of rethink some of the approaches we've seen around those issues and, and be critical of them in ways that perhaps we didn't necessarily have the language to express before. Um, you know, like some of us did, but I'm just saying like these, this, these kinds of readings help arm us with that kind of language to better, to be more critical of what we see going on in the present. Um, I feel like there's a small piece of, uh, uh, with uh, communities of color, uh, especially within black communities of like internalized, or like uh, with an internal community uh, critique where, mm-hmm. you know, like, being able to critique these things within an audience that's receptive to those critiques in such a way that it's not emboldening the the opposition, it, but is actually still engaging in the type of critical analysis that uh, any of these authors would advocate. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is somewhat lost in some segments of society, but is pro- perhaps uh, easier to map onto their already existing material conditions for various communities of color. It's also like, it's one of the, I mean, we, I've often seen it reduces like, don't air your dirty laundry, you know, <laughs> like mm-hmm. you have this like kind of intra community dialogue that in, in some social spaces ends up becoming an all community discussion when it maybe shouldn't be. Um, and I think we kind of saw that. I agree with, with the Bolivian case um, and some others, but if you're thinking about, let's say like people who study Bolivia, so scholars who work on it versus, you know, um, human rights groups, indigenous groups, environmental groups, people who were critical of Evo Morales from the left, uh, people who were part of his party and then defected or changed in some way. Um, the, all these, like, just thinking about the communities on the left, right? I'm not even talking, I'm not including the people on the right who are, like, mm-hmm. taking power right now. Um, but I'm talking about just sort of, like, this intra-community dialogue about what kind of country people want Bolivia to be. And I don't think that there was a, I don't think it was the place, to be honest, of some Western scholars to continue harping on the problems when they were not, it doesn't, I guess what I'm saying is it doesn't add anything at that time, right? It's one thing to have that discussion before a coup happens, 
right? You can be, mm -hmm. you know, if you study and you know the, uh, the circumstances and whatever, and you say to yourself, like, oh, I study this place, or I learned about this place, or I'm even, I'm from this place, I know what's happening there, and this, this, and the third. But I think that there's also a degree to which, you know, you have to know when to back down and to understand that, like, what you're saying is contributing to the side that wants to hurt a big chunk of the country. And it's sort of like if you see someone who's who's, I don't know, bleeding to death on the side of the road, you don't ask them what they ate for lunch. <laughs> like, you're like, sir, your your BMI looks too high. You know, you're like, you go get them help. Right. And so but if you're bleeding to death, if you see someone bleeding to death, you're not you're going to call an ambulance. You're going to try to give them emergency assistance and you're not going to ask them these silly questions or like harp on some aspect of their appearance or whatever. You're going to help them. Right. And so I think that's how it kind of when I when I saw what was going down it felt like this like nitpicky unnecessary almost arguably violent um approach to what was happening because they were adding to the dialogue that was being spewed by people who were definitely doing it in in um bad faith you know um and it made it, it sort of blurred the roles of these people with academic knowledge and and like, what is, what is their role in a moment like this? And I agree with you that perhaps useful idiots, you know, despite its problems as a phrase, but I, I think it definitely, mm -hmm. it could apply here. And they were being useful idiots, not only of Western propaganda and Western imperialism, but also of um, a very violent and reactionary right wing in, in Bolivia and, and other places as well. I mean, we've seen this in Brazil, Bolivia, and throughout Latin America and other parts of the world. Um, and we have to be careful Especially, I think, as people who are from the West, live in the West and understanding like our, I mean, it's kind of, it's different for us because we're speaking as like people who are oppressed within the West too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it's kind of this awkward position that you're in. But I think that that should make us even more introspective about our role and our need to express solidarity with communities and groups that are being um, oppressed by our country in our name. I'm like, oh, no, I don't think so. Like, you can't. Don't don't go to some place and tear up their country and say it's for U.S. like to help <laughs> right. and and protect the U.S. What have you done for me? Like you're going and killing millions of Iraqis or uh, people from Afghanistan or whatever, which that Afghanistan report is something else we should have. We could have a whole episode on. Um, but, you know, that doing that is not in the service of people like me or like you or the grand majority of our country. And even if it were quote unquote in the service of our interests, it's not something that should be done without my consent. And that's not in my name. Like, no, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't vote for that. Mm -hmm. I didn't get to have a decision in that. And, and I didn't get to say no, it was without my consent. And I think there are a lot of decisions that are made supposedly on our behalf. that are not in our consent and that, that we would not give the okay to, and that then are we're supposed to be grateful of, over, you know, like I don't want anyone losing their life to support the military industrial complex and the war machine. And then saying it's about me. No, no. Take, take my name out your mouth. You know, like that's where I am about these right. sorts of things. But, and, as, and meanwhile, it's like you can add up all our enemies and it turns out that our own military and the servicemen and women that are coming back uh, and the days that are coming back, from uh, serving overseas or killing themselves and each other at a greater rate than any of our enemies. And so mm -hmm. like, it, it's definitely not in our interest and it's, it's having horrific consequences. And then despite an ever increasing and ballooning military budget, we're not taking care of these people's basic needs still. And so right. like, right. Uh, like if, however you feel about people in the military, everybody deserves to have their basic needs met. And that, that we're such a wealthy country that sends these people to go fight and die for profits uh, and then can't even share them enough so that they can avoid that they can participate in the society that they come back to is is just uh, emblematic of a uh, deep rot within uh, our society really in my opinion yeah yes it is so on that note <laughs> we always end on such happy notes here at left poc um but yeah on that note i think we should close out this section one of our discussion of the little red book and for the next uh, installment of this reading revolution um series of the left pocket project podcast we'll be talking about the second half of the little red book and then in the third installment we'll be talking about as i already mentioned the sort of historical context and some of the inspiration that the book had on other um revolutionary groups and leftist thinkers um and you know i think 
I think it's, it's a nice, again, it's a nice way to kind of close out the year um, to read something like this, because I think it really does do a good job, despite it being kind of a, just a collection of quotes. It, it does a really good job of succinctly addressing a lot of the things that we saw happen throughout the year um, and addresses as well a lot of the readings that we did this and, and a little bit of last year. So I'm really excited to continue working on this. Um, and I'm, ex I'm really excited about our discussion about the way it was applied um, within other revolutionary groups. I think that's going to be a really cool discussion. Um, Richard, did you have any last minute things you wanted to add before I close out? Uh, just to that point uh, that you just made there is that I had no idea just how prolific and widespread and influential it was, it, like in a variety of movements since, throughout history, uh, post its creation, and also the cultural context within. And so uh, I think it's a very, I'm, I'm excited to continue reading that aspect of it. And so I do hope people stick around for part three as well. Cool. Thanks. And thank you for listening to the Left Pocket Project podcast. Again, don't forget to check us out on social media as well as Patreon. And that's patreon.com slash leftpoc. Have a good one.